Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, let's turn our Bibles to Psalm chapter 37, verse 23. Psalm chapter 37, verse 23. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. And I read, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he, the Lord, delights in the way of the man. Uh, we bless the name of the Lord for his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We bless and exalt your holy name as we go into your word this morning. Father, we pray you will open our eyes of understanding. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will do a work, a work of teaching even in our hearts today. And we pray, Lord, that your word will do that which only it can do in our lives. It will do a work of sanctification, to do a work of transformation, a work of renewing and reviving. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. The title of our message today is The Steps of the Righteous. The Steps of the Righteous. So in our reading in Psalm chapter 20, uh, 37, uh, we see that the psalm is there is using the analogy of an individual who is walking, um, specifically by the steps of the feet, down a way path. He is using this analogy to communicate an essential truth to us. And that essential truth is that God Almighty is intimately and perpetually involved in the affairs of the righteous. So he says the steps of the man See that the man there is the righteous man, the righteous woman. And we know that because he says that it is the, th this individual is someone whose way delights the Lord. Only the righteous delights the Lord in their ways. So the psalmist is teaching us an essential truth. God Almighty is intimately and perpetually involved in the affairs of the righteous. Brennan, I believe that this truth is uh, one that we as believers should know, we should be reminded of constantly until it becomes a conviction in our lives, until it becomes a conviction in our lives that God is intimately and perpetually interested in all the affairs of our lives. A benefit of having this conviction, brethren, the benefit is that as a believer, you can now enjoy the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. A peace, a kind of peace that the world can neither give nor the world knows. We see that in John 14, verse 27, where Christ declares to his disciples that my peace I give to you, not as the peace of the world. Or as we see in Philippians 4, 17, which tells us that the peace of of God that surpasses all understanding. This kind of peace in the heart of the believer is a benefit of living with the conviction that God is intimately interested in every affair of your life. And in this ongoing pandemic that we're going through, one of the observations that I have made and that's been helpful to me is that the pandemic has actually magnified the importance of the peace of Christ in the heart of an individual. This pandemic has magnified it more than anything else that I, I have experienced in my life, the importance of the peace of Christ in the heart of an individual. Because we see the pandemic brings about daily uncertainties and it has daily effects. And all of these effects and uncertainties, they create anxieties and fears and hopelessness and destruction at, at levels that we have never seen, at least I have certainly never seen in my lifetime, and not just for me, but all across the world. And so in the midst of all of these uncertainties, in the midst of all of this anxiety, the message of the psalmist is important to the righteous today, to the disciples of Christ today, to those who are disciples indeed, and the message is this, let not your hearts be troubled, but rather let your heart be guarded by the peace of Christ, because God is in intimate control of your life. Let me say that again. 
The message of the psalmist to us today, to the disciples indeed, is let not your hearts be troubled, but let your heart be guarded by the peace of Christ, because God is in ultimate and intimate control of your life. We shall explore these issues in the remainder of our message under three points. The first point is that God owns the future. God owns the future. The second point is that God wants to order your steps. He wants to order my steps. God wants to order your steps. And the third point is, whose steps will God order? We will answer a question there. Whose steps will God order? Pray the Lord will help us in the remainder of this message. So on to our first point, God owns the future. God indeed owns the future. There is an, there's an uncertainty about the future, and this uncertainty is common and it's familiar. It's a familiar limitation to every man, to everyone across age, across race, across cultures. We are all very familiar with the uncertainty of the future. In fact, the assertion that no man knows tomorrow, no man knows tomorrow, I believe is one that exists in every language, in every culture, and it has been true since the dawn of time and will remain so forever. No man knows tomorrow. And the point here is not to dismiss the efficacy of prophecy. After all, prophecy tells about the future. The point there is not to dismiss the efficacy or the validity of prophecy. And the reason for that is because prophecy is a gift of God. It is not a human ability. So the point still stands. In the power of man, solely in the abilities of man, no man knows tomorrow. The future is uncertain. It's as dark as pitch blackness. So rather, our point here is to emphasize that man is helpless, is to emphasize the helplessness of man to prepare for what the next day, the next hour might bring, the challenge that is hiding behind the next day. Man is totally hopeless and helpless in his own strength in preparing for that. This wisdom, this wisdom, and this is wisdom indeed, it is abundantly thought by scripture. And so let's look at a few uh, verses. First, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. Proverbs 27, verse 1. It tells us that scripture tells us, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring. Do not boast. And this is true for all of us. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 7 tells us, For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? For he will, he's talking about man here. The man does not know what is to be, what is to come, for who can tell him how it will be? Since no one knows what will happen, no one can tell a man what will happen after them. And so in these verses and in more, 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 11 tells us there and puts it very poignantly. Like, Let him who puts on the armor not boast as him who takes it off. In other words, the person who puts on an armor to go to battle should not be proud because he does not know if he will be the one to take off his own armor, or if it will perish and others will have to take off that armor. And so with these verses and more, Luke chapter 12, 19 to 20, James chapter 4, 12 to 14, what we see here is the abject helplessness of man to prepare for what lies ahead. And so with this context in mind, let us return to our main text in Psalm 37 verse 23, where we previously observed that the psalmist is not talking about, and when the psalmist says steps, we realize he's not talking about an individual who is taking a stroll on the path, but rather the psalmist is talking about the life affairs of 
individuals. The, the, the psalmist is talking more generally about the affairs, about the life issues, the day-to-day -day activities, the day-to-day -day challenges of human beings. And so we readily recognize this analogy because even in our everyday vernacular, we commonly use the words steps and ways to refer to our decisions, our actions, and our plans. We do this routinely. We ask, what are the next steps? What steps did you take to accomplish this? What did you do? What way are you going to go? Which way do we go? These are, these are terms that we routinely use in our common day-to-day -day vernacular to refer to actions, to decisions, to plans, and to outcomes. Moreover, we recognize, we recognize that the difference between our present and past circumstances can often be explained by our past steps and ways. So in other words, the difference between where I am today and where I was sometime in the future, five years in the past, five years ago, 10 years ago, the difference between those circumstances can be explained by the actions and the decisions and the plans that I have made in the preceding time. Similarly, similarly, the difference between our present time, our present circumstances, and our future will, we hope, be determined by our future steps, our future ways, our future decisions. And so that's why a farmer who is celebrating a bountiful harvest can easily and eagerly tell you of the steps that brought him to, this, to that particular reality. He can tell you about how he, sold, he took a handful of seeds and rather than cook and eat them, he decided to sow them. And after sowing them, he did not ignore those seeds, rather he dutifully nurtured the crops that budded from those seeds by watering them, by clearing away the weeds, and by patiently waiting for the crops to mature into a harvest. That is how he came about the bountiful harvest. We all recognize this. However, anyone with any modest amount of life experience will tell you that things don't always work out that smoothly. In other words, in, in, in other words, even when we take all the right decisions as according to our knowledge and all the right steps, it may not lead to the expected outcome. We see this, this is why millions of people, millions of people will buy a lottery ticket. They all did the same thing, but only one of them, only one of them will win the prize. To the unbeliever, to the secular world, the issue here, the problem here is the presence or the absence of luck in a situation. In other words, the difference between the expected and the unexpected outcome is, can be explained by luck, according to the unbeliever. However, to the believer who has the truth of the scriptures, we know, we learn that God is the difference between an expected outcome and an unexpected one. This is because God is in control of all times and seasons. These are the times and seasons that happens to all men according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Time and seasons, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to celebrate, a time to mourn. All of these times and seasons happens to all men. And God is the one who is in control of this. And this fact is indisputable. Furthermore, God knows every intimate detail of every single day of every individual from birth to death. This is what the Bible teaches us. If we turn quickly to Psalm chapter 139, 139 verse 16. Psalm 139 verse 16, there we read, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. The psalmist here is telling us this, this profound truth that even as individuals, for every single one of us, every single one of us, every moment of every day that we will live here on earth, every moment of every day that we'll live here on earth, God already knew the intimate details of each one of those, even before we were born, even before we existed. And what this means for you, my brothers and sisters, is that especially in these times of great uncertainties, 
while the world is hopelessly tied to the false god of luck, you, the Christian, can enjoy the surpassing peace that comes from knowing a God who holds tomorrow in his hands. You, my brothers and my sisters, you can, leave, you can have, you can enjoy that peace that comes from knowing that you know a God. You are serving the true God who holds tomorrow in his hands and who nothing catches by surprise. And so God owns the future. Let's move on to the next point. God wants to order your steps. So now that we know that God owns the future and we know that he is in control of the future, the good news for us from the psalmist is that God wants to order your steps. This is great news because the one who knows the tomorrow is interested in helping you and I navigate the future where we cannot, which we could not do on our own. This is good news. Moreover, the picture we see from Psalm, Psalm 37 verse 23, our main text, is that God is ordering the steps of a man in a manner that which an adult will guide the uncertain steps of a toddler or a person with vision will guide the steps of a blind person uh, down a path. So you see, God does not guide like a general who would give broad directions or broad ideas or broad guidance and then leave it to you to figure out the details. On the contrary, what we see in Psalm 37 verse 23 is that God wants to guide the steps of the believer in a personal, in an intimate way, in a detailed way, on a day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute basis. And we get this assurance straight from scripture. God wants to order our steps, the steps of the righteous in the following ways. First, we'll see that he will point the way that we should go. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21 tells us that, And your ears, here is God speaking to the righteous, And your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk in it. And when you turn to the right, or when you turn to the left, God is intimately interested in guiding you in the way to go. He will point the way out to you. We also see from scripture that God will lead us through uncertainties that we are blind to. Uncertainties that we are blind to. Isaiah 42 verse 16. Isaiah 42 verse 16. The Lord says here, And I will lead the blind in the way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them, brethren. Are you encouraged by that? Even through the uncertainties that we are blind to, God has promised to lead us through it. He will make the darkness be as light. He will make the rough grounds be level. He will lead us, even though we are blind, He will lead us with steady footsteps through it all. And thirdly, we see that he will guide us with intimate attention with his own eyes. Psalm 32 verse 8 tells us, I will instruct you, Psalm 32 verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. God guides us with intimate attention. And finally, we see that God will never leave us nor forsake us. These are the assurances that we have that God wants to order our steps. God wants, brethren, God wants to order your steps. He wants to order my steps. I hope this brings you great comfort and assurance to be reminded that not only is God able to guide you through present and future uncertainties, but he actually desires to do so for you on an intimate level. And as we see in more details when we consider our final point, this intimate way that God orders the steps and ways of the righteous is manifested through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. That's how God manifests. That's how God manifests and orders our ways and our steps in His intimate way. So as we wrap up on this particular point, on this particular point, I want us to be mindful that someone else is also interested in the steps of the righteous. Someone nefarious is also interested in the steps of the righteous, and that is Satan. You see, Satan's purposes 
and his interest in the steps of the righteous is to obstruct, is to distract, is to delay and hopefully derail the ordained steps of the righteous. This is why scriptures cautions us to be wary of Satan because he goes about prowling about like a roaring lion seeking womb to devour. So we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. As children of God, we need to be worried that Satan also is also interested in the steps, in our ways, in our plans, in our actions. However, despite the threat, despite this caution, we should remember that we can be comforted and not be alarmed. Because even when we fall, God's mercies are more than sufficient to restore us. And we see that in Proverbs chapter 24, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Even when we fall, even when we stumble because of the attacks, because of the op opposition of Satan, we should not be alarmed. We should be comforted because God is mercies are abundant and will restore us. In Proverbs 24 verse 16, we read there that for the righteous fall seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. And even in our text that we are reading in Psalm chapter 30, 37, verse 24, uh, we read there that though the righteous falls, it will not be overwhelmed. It will not be overwhelmed for the Lord is holding his hand. So even when we stumble, even when we make a misstep because we are human, let us still be assured, let us still be comforted that the mercies of God are much more abundant and that they are sufficient to restore us back onto the right path. Pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now move on to the final step, to the final point. So we have seen in our final, in our first point that God owns the future. And so for a Christian, this is a, an assurance. This is a comfort to know that we are serving the God, the only one who owns, who controls the future. So we need not worry. We need not live a life of worry, even when the world is gripped in anxiety, in, 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 in uncertainties, in nerves, in nervousness, in fears, the Christians should be able to enjoy the surpassing peace that comes from God because God owns the future. And the second point that we talked about was that God wants to order your steps. God is interested in ordering your steps. So you and I can take advantage, we can be assured in that. We can take advantage of that, that God is interested in ordering our steps. So we don't need to fear uncertainties because we can trust in God who is willing, who is desiring to order our steps. And moving on to the final points, whose steps will God order? So in this final point, we'll consider the obvious question that arises. How can I ensure that my steps are ordered by God? How can I ensure that my steps are ordered by God? So here we can return back to, the, to our main text in Psalm 37 verse 23. Psalm 37 verse 23, there we read that the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. And there we see that the psalmist thankfully gives us a very direct answer. How can I ensure that my steps are ordered by the Lord? The answer is God orders the steps of those whose ways are delightful to him. God orders the steps of those whose life choices whose decisions are delightful to him. In other words, to ensure that God is ordering your steps, to ensure that God will order your steps, you must live a life of obedience to God and faith in God. We must live a life of obedience to God and a life of faith in God. That is the way we can ensure that God will order our steps. That's what we read in the Psalms because he delights in their ways. This is because it is true obedience. It's only true, true obedience and faith that we can live a life that is fully pleasing to God. A life that is absent of absolute obedience to God or a life that is full, that's filled with unbelief or, or lack of faith in God cannot please God. 
It is only then, it is only when we live a life of absolute obedience and faith in God, it is only then that our focus, our desires, our plans, our ambitions and actions can be shaped by the word of God and the indwelling of the Spirit of God. It is when we are living a life of true obedience and of true faith in God that our lives, our focus, our desires, our plans, and all that is in us is shaped by the word of God and the indwelling of the Spirit of God. It is only at that point that we can truly say, as Christ said in John chapter 6, verse 38, that I have not come to do my will, but to do the will of my Father who sent me. It is only when we get to that point that we can make such bold, true statements. It is only then, it is only at that point that we can be like Joseph, who, when he was faced with a choice of sin, when he was faced with a choice of sin with the wife of Potiphar, his first thought, his first thought was not, was not the, 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 the pleasure or the punishment that might come from his action. Rather, his first thought was how his choice will impact God. As we see in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, his first thought, his first thought was, how will my choice, how will my action impact God? As he asked, he asked the wife of Potiphar, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it's only when we, a person who is living a life of absolute obedience and faith in God that such can be seen in their life. And while we realize that attaining this ideal of fully delighting God in all of our ways. We realize that this is a high calling. We realize that this is a high calling. Nevertheless, nevertheless, brethren, we must press on towards it. This is the goal for which we must press on towards us. Apostle Paul exhorted us in Philippians 3.14. We must press on towards this ideal. Yes, we cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot do it in our own strength. Yes, it's a daunting tax. But we are encouraged in this. We are encouraged in this, in the knowledge that even though our flesh is indeed weak, so relying on our own flesh, on our flesh alone, there is no way we can live a life that is fully pleasing to God. So even though in that knowledge, yet with scriptures encourages us that with God, all things are indeed possible. So if we, if we, with that knowledge, can humbly and regularly submit ourselves to the transforming power of the word of God and to the gentle direction of the Holy Spirit, a life that is fully pleasing to God can indeed, can indeed become our testimony. What we need is to humbly and regularly submit ourselves to the transforming power of the word of God and to the gentle direction of the Holy Spirit. Then our testimony can indeed be that we live a life that is fully pleasing to God. As we wrap up, let us consider the, let's spend the last few moments to consider the life of Joseph as one whose steps were ordered by God because his life was fully pleasing to God. So let's consider that. See in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, at the end of it all, at the end of it all, Joseph eloquently summarized his life by observing that God had taken all the evil accounts, all the evil evils that occurred in his life because of man, all the evil actions of other people that, have, that were inflicted on him at different points in his life, God had taken all of that evil and had used it to achieve a greater good of preserving the lives of men. Can you see that? Can you imagine that? Let's read that quickly. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. There we see Joseph says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Can you imagine that? That even through when, when Joseph was going through all that he was going through, to the circular eye, Joseph would have looked as a thorough, like a thoroughly unlucky guy. This guy was totally an unlucky guy all of his life. To the, to the unbelieving eye, 
Joseph would have been someone you don't want to associate with because surely he must have been cursed because he was so unlucky. I mean, this is a guy who was dumped in the pit, who was sold to slavery, who was falsely accused, who was dumped in prison and forgotten in prison, all the while doing nothing wrong, all the while doing nothing wrong. Left to the hum from the human perspective, Joseph was an unlucky individual. But what we see here is the wisdom of God revealed in scripture and revealed through Joseph himself that yet through it all, yet through all that he went through and time will fail us to go through to, to weave together this pattern. Through it all, God was weaving a pattern of salvation like only he could. God was putting in, 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 in sequence a plan that would save not only J Jacob and his entire family, but will also save the, the nation of Egypt from starvation during the famine. This is what God was doing. So from the human eye, Joseph was suffering needlessly because of bad luck, but yet God in his own realm, operating in his realm that is above the wisdom and the intelligence of man was creating, working out, weaving out a pattern of salvation. Can you imagine that? How awesome is God? Through it all, we see that the life of Joseph was defined, was defined by steadfast obedience to God's word in abstaining from sin and childlike trust in God for his ultimate justification and deliverance. And can we, and to the glory of God, we see that he was indeed delivered. He was delivered in a mighty way. He was promoted in a mighty way. And God did bring to pass his own plans through the life of Joseph. And so, brethren, I want us to remember that through the obedience and the faithfulness of one individual, Joseph, God saved his entire family and saved the nation. And that could be our portion as well, that through our own absolute obedience and faith in God, we have no idea what God could do to save our families, our loved ones, and our generation. So brethren, if we want God to order our steps, just as we've seen with the life of Joseph, then let us from today on press on toward the life of absolute obedience and faith in God. I assure you, the Lord will surely help us. He will surely help us in this because we know that it is not in our strength, but with God, all things are possible. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. We bless and exalt your name for your word that comes quicker and sharper than any double-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, for your word that comes to sanctify. We thank you, Lord, that your word, your word that comes to give enlightenment to our simple minds. We thank you for your word that comes to wash us clean. We thank you, Lord, for your word that comes to build up our faith. We thank you, Lord, for your word that comes to sustain and uphold us, O God. We bless your name for your word. Lord, please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Lord, even as we have looked into your word today and we have seen that our steps can indeed be ordered by you because your desire is to order the steps of the righteous. Father God, even as your children, we look up to you today for you to order our steps. We realize that we need to live a life of absolute obedience and faith in you for that to happen. Lord, we realize that we cannot do this in our own strength. So Lord, we humbly submit ourselves to you to this morning and pray that you will do your work in our lives in Jesus' name. Father God, give us the spirit of humility, O oh God. Father Lord, help us to be obedient children to you, O oh God. Father, Lord, build up our faith, increase our faith to be of a childlike trust towards you, O oh God. Father, Lord, even as we press on, O oh Lord, Father, God, meet us at the point of our needs in the name of Jesus, at this point of our supplication, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, let your peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, Lord, we pray that our testimony will be indeed like that of Joseph, that even all of the evil that comes our way, that, Lord, you will use it for good. Order our steps and our ways, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, let our life be delightful to you in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.
Let's share the grace, let's share the grace and fellowship as we round up. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Have a blessed week Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen.